Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known the gen- to make known among the Gentiles the glorious righteousness of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not made me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full righteous of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is the word of God. As a minister, every now and then you bump into a passage of scripture that makes you stop in your tracks and go, what are we doing? What are we actually doing as a church? This is one of those passages. There are two parts to it. In verses 24 to 29, Paul is describing the principles of ministry in general. And then in chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, he's applying those principles to the local church at Colossae. Immediately you might say, well, that's nice, that's Paul's ministry, but what does any of that have to do with me? It's a great question. He was an apostle, and he was used by the Spirit of God in unique ways at a unique time in salvation history. It was a unique time in the sense that the Spirit of God was busy founding the church on the Word of God. So I don't know about you, but nothing I write down is inspired and makes it into the Bible. Hasn't happened yet. Our actions and words are not validated by miracles and signs and wonders like they were for the apostles who were founding the church on the word of God. Ministry today is different, but it's also the same. It's also the same. And everything we read in this passage still applies today. How do we know? Well, because you find Paul elsewhere in the New Testament calling on his church leaders, calling on Titus and Timothy and the Ephesian elders to do exactly the same things that we find in this passage. So this passage is about ordinary ministry in the local church. Does that mean it's for pastors? And the rest of us can switch over to Netflix now. Sorry, but no. Because as the Bible makes so clear, and as our Reformed tradition makes so clear, ministry is for every Christian. Every Christian is a minister. We affirm, because the Bible teaches and the Reformers reminded us, we affirm the ministry of all believers. Ministry is not for gurus. Christian ministry is not for those who draw a church salary or for those who've been to Bible college. Every single Christian Every single one of us is a minister. So then if this passage is about ministry, it has to be for all of us. This passage tells us the business of the church. What is the business of the church? What are we supposed to be doing? We're about to find out. I can see seven marks of local church ministry in this passage of scripture. I'm sure there are more but seven jump out at us. So there's the calling, the cost, the center, the method, the goal, the means, and the reason. I know some of you take notes, so let me just run through that again. The calling, the cost, the center, the method, the goal, the means, and the reason. The calling. The call to ministry is a call to service. In fact, it's even stronger than that. It's a call to servanthood. Not just a call to service, a call to servanthood. 
So it's not just a call to do something. It's a call to be something. You know, I can bang on the piano, but that doesn't make me a pianist. You see the difference? It's a world of difference. I'm not just called to service. I'm called to servanthood. Look at chapter 1, verse 23. Paul describes himself as a minister of the gospel. In verse 25, he describes himself as a minister of the church. That word minister doesn't mean pastor or rector or church leader. It means servant. Now, you wouldn't think so when you think of some of our cabinet ministers or even some of our church ministers. But that's actually what it means. A minister is a servant. At the end of verse 24, Paul is talking about the church and he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for the church, of which I have become a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. In other words, I became a servant of the church according to God's plans and purposes. It was God's plan that I become a servant of the gospel and of the church. The Apostle Paul understands himself to be a servant by the will of God. It's not quite like that with today's apostles, is it? And it's so interesting. Today's church leaders are very interested in titles. We love titles, especially here in Africa. It's so telling which titles we choose. It tells you so much about what we think of the church, what we think the church is for, and what our role in the church is. Which titles do we choose? Man of God, prophet, reverend doctor, professor, major one. Did you notice that no one is queuing up for the title servant? No one wants to be known as a servant of anything, let alone the church. I mean, that is not the message you're trying to convey. That's not the brand you're trying to build. Today's apostles exist to be served, not to serve. If you call yourself servant, it's really confusing your brand. It's just not the image you're going for. What about you and me? If church is for everyone, if ministry is for everyone and not just the paid staff, do you think of yourself as a servant? We say time and time again, in Christ, we are a redeemed family of servants. Well, is that how you think of yourself as a servant? Is that how you live out your involvement in this local church? Are you a servant? Do you exist for others? Or, what's the alternative? You've heard me say this before. Are you a consumer? Does the church exist for you? We are so trained to think and live as consumers. It's actually so ingrained in us. It comes so naturally. You know, I see it. I see it play out when people come to me and they say things like, the church needs to offer more for kids. Or the church needs to write better material. Or the church needs to do X, Y, Z. And what I need to remind them in that moment, what I sometimes do uh, when, when I'm brave enough, is you are the church. That's what I should be saying. You know, the church needs to do this. But, but who's the church? You are the church. And right now, you're acting like a consumer. A consumer says, I've paid my tithe, and so this church must meet, meet my needs, or I'm going to go elsewhere. I'm going to vote with my feet. You know, the market for churches is very competitive. I don't need to be here. A servant sees that same gap, that same hole, and trust me, there are many holes. I'm not denying that for one second. But a servant sees that same gap in the kids' ministry, for instance, and says, well, here's an opportunity for me to love the family and to contribute to the kids' ministry. I'm going to fill that gap. Do you see the difference in mindset? It sounds small, but when that penny drops, it's a radical change in your life. 
and a change, a radical change in the lives of those around you. It's a radical change in our church. Contrary to popular belief, church is not a Sunday service provider. You know, people think of the church, that's the place where you get your kid baptized, you get your wedding sorted out, uh, you, they'll, they'll organize your burial, and uh, you can get your docs certified. That's kind of what the church is there for. On the contrary, church is an opportunity for you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to love others. Now, during lockdown, that has its own challenges, but it's not impossible. Remember back to each one, reach one. If you've fallen off that wagon, forget about it. Just jump back on. And this week, why don't you call just three people, three phone calls. Call someone up. Find out how they're going. How are you doing? What are you struggling with? Let them know that you love them. You don't have to say it in so many words. For some of, that's, for, for some of us, that's tough. But just the fact that you call them will demonstrate it. And remind them that Jesus loves them. And those words you do have to say. And just encourage them to keep going. And if you do that, you will be living out your identity as a servant. Such a simple thing to do. Firstly, ministry is a call to service. Secondly, ministry comes with a cost. In verse 24, Paul talks about suffering for the sake of the church. He talks about toiling and struggling in verse 29. And in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, he says to the Colossians, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. When Paul uses words like these to describe his ministry, he's not talking about the difficult youth pastor. And he's not talking about the church water bill. I'm sure those things were on his radar. But we get a better sense of what he's actually talking about when we read his letter to the Corinthians. And he's in this part of the letter, he's writing against those who are trying to discredit his service. And this is what he writes. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And here he builds to a climax. And apart from these other things, there is the daily pressure, the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Ministry comes with a cost. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to be the Apostle Paul. I don't even think he's suggesting that. But what I think he would insist on is that ministry involves struggling and suffering. It's not that we look for it. It's that it comes part of the package deal. Now, you and I are not being flogged. We're not being beaten with rods. But is there any cost to your involvement with this church? Because ministry comes with a cost. If there's no cost, there's no ministry. By its very nature, service of others is a denial of self. What you give to others, you're taking from yourself. So no cost, no ministry. What is your ministry costing you? What price do you put on the service of others? What is your threshold? What's the limit? Will you go as far as convenience allows, but no further? As far as your other activities allow, and no further? Would you describe your involvement in the church, the Christ church family, as a labor and a toil? Are you laboring and toiling and struggling struggling for the family and for the gospel. I know that many of you are, many of you are, and it is such a joy for me to partner in the gospel with you. You know, you are, you are such a challenge to me. You're such an encouragement to me. You're such a model to me in, in your zeal for the gospel, in your, in your struggle, in your labor to make the gospel known. But the others of us, and perhaps this is you, who can't think of any cost to your ministry. And perhaps this is 
an opportunity just to stop and reflect and repent and to change. You don't have to fall into the depths of despair. Just take that regret to the Lord Jesus and ask him to change you. There's another danger. The one danger is no cost and therefore no ministry. The other danger is all cost, but still no ministry. There are some who labor and toil and struggle. You work yourselves to the bone for this church. But it's still not Christian ministry. What do I mean by that? It's still not done for the love of God and for the love of others. How can you know the difference? What's the test? Well, one test is in verse 24. I rejoice in my sufferings for the church. I rejoice. If you are laboring and toiling and struggling to earn your place in the family, to elevate your place in the family, or to win the recognition of others in the family, well, that's not ministry. That's religion. Only genuine ministry, genuine service can give you joy. Religion might give you the buzz that comes with a sense of achieve, achievement, the sense that you've earned the attention of, of others around you and of God. But only true ministry can give you true joy. When you work hard religiously, you are going to expect acknowledgement. And if it doesn't come, if you don't get it, you're going to be angry or bitter. It's another sign. You certainly won't expect to suffer for your service, suffering on top of your service. If you do suffer, the best that religion can offer you is some sort of stoic sense of detachment. You just need to grit your teeth and bear it. It's grim determination. Just get through it. But Christian ministry can give you true joy even in your suffering. Not by pretending the suffering isn't there, but by knowing that it is achieving an eternal good. Now, ministry acknowledges this work is hard, this is tough, but there are great things underway, and the best is still to come. The Lord has promised to use even this painful service for good. Even if I can't see any evidence of it right now, he's promised to use it for good, and I know I can trust him. A consumer is in and out, right? Keep your hands clean, get your spiritual top up for the week, onto the real business of life. A minister knows there's a cost, gladly accepts the cost for the joy set before her. A minister is a cheerful giver whose ministry is not fueled by acknowledgements or accolades or thank yous or honors, but by joy. Joy. Where does that joy come from? We'll say more on that in just a moment. But for now, ministry is a calling. Ministry comes with a cost. Third, ministry has a center. It has a center. Chapter 1, verse 25, read with me. Paul's task is to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knitted together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. At the center of church business is a mystery, a profound mystery, that mystery is Christ himself. In Christ is our hope of glory. In Christ is all wisdom and knowledge. Now, what, is, what does it mean to say that Christ is a mystery? A mystery hidden for ages past. I mean, that's a reference to God's dealings with his people recorded for us in the Old Testament. The great mystery is how this holy God can be true to himself and live in the midst of this sinful, wicked, rebellious people? How can he dwell with a mankind who have disowned him and disgraced him and constantly do so? 
over the centuries, he slowly reveals what his plan for mankind is. And that plan is revealed in its fullness in Jesus Christ. The mystery hidden for generations and ages past is unveiled in Christ. God solves the problem of God and man by becoming a man as God. Jesus holds the two, the two that should not be able to be reconciled. He holds the two together in himself. He is the saving ruling center of God's plan for all of history. And he is the saving ruling center of church and of the business of church. Ministry has a center. Jesus Christ is that center. We do a lot of good things at Christ Church Midrand. That's not to say that we do them well. It's just to say that they are worthy pursuits. They are good things, whether we do them well or not. So we are involved in education, in caring for the poor, in racial reconciliation, in caring for those who have suffered grief or divorce or addiction. And soon, God willing, we will be involved in a formal way in caring for women and children who are the survivors of abuse. Those are good things. They're profoundly good things. But none of them is at the center of our ministry, nor should it be. The center belongs to a person. The moment we give the center to someone or something else, may the Lord shut us down. That is my sincere prayer. The moment we give it away, may, may he use all those wonderful facilities on the corner of 9th and 11th. I'm standing in them right now. May he use it all for something else. A judo hall, five-a-side soccer facility, a builder's warehouse, a nursery, you name it. Point is, may all of those facilities be anything but church. Because we will not be worthy of the name if Jesus Christ is not at the center. Of course, if he is at the center, which is his only rightful place, we will keep doing all of those things and we will do them better and we will do them for longer because they will be motivated by love for the king and love for his people. God's plan for all of history is to put Jesus at the center. It's a wonderful plan. It has wonderful blessings. Two of those blessings are listed for us right here in our passage. The first is the hope of glory. Glory is a big, hairy, theological word. It carries a lot of freight. Basically, glory is the godness of God. Glory is the godness of God revealed to mankind. For a human being to encounter God's glory is to experience God in all his mind-blowing, heart-wrenching, soul-satisfying beauty and perfection. That's an encounter with glory. And in Christ, that is our hope. Remember, biblical hope is not about your dreams or ambitions. Biblical hope is a reality. It's just a future reality. In Christ, God is inviting us into his glory. God's glory is our certain future. So whatever our struggles or our sufferings in ministry now, whatever the cost of being a servant, we can face all of that cheerfully, joyfully, because we know where we're headed. See how this works? A.W. Tozer said, The glory of God always comes at the sacrifice of self. In other words, we experience God's glory through service. Andrew Murray says it this way, humility is nothing but the disappearance of the self in the vision that God is all. God's glory through service in Christ. The center of ministry is Jesus himself, and he makes the cost of ministry something we can bear with joy. Gets even better. The blessings of being in Christ are not limited to the future. Chapter 2 verse 3 speaks about Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, wisdom is the truth of Christ applied to everyday life. Not only is Jesus at the center of the meaning of life, you know, kind of the big grand narrative, but he's also the center of your everyday grind, your nine to five. He's literally a treasure chest, a vault. The word is thesaurus. With 
all, so he's this treasure chest with all that you need to live a life pleasing to God in the here and now as you hope for glory. So God answers the question, what is the purpose of my life? You know, that big overarching question. But he also answers the question, what am I supposed to do with this annoying colleague? You know, the one with the B.O. who doesn't know how to respect your personal space and keeps taking your credit. What am I supposed to do with him? The answer, the center of the answer to both of those questions, the enormous kind of meaning of life question and the trivial question of the mundane details of our lives, the answer at the center of both is Jesus Christ. In ministry, we can make the mistake of making it one or the other, right? So either Jesus is only the hope of glory, so he's a ticket to heaven and this life is just a waiting room, or Jesus is only the key to wisdom. So he's a ticket to my best life now and whatever follows, follows. The only way to remedy that imbalance is to keep him at the center of everything because that's where he actually is. We're soldiering on. Fourth mark of ministry, method. If Jesus is at the center of everything, what should the church be doing? What should, we, what should we be busy with? What's our core business, right? What, what's our core business? Good question. Chapter 1, verse 28. Him we proclaim. We proclaim him. We tell people about Jesus. We don't have to put him at the center. He's already there. We just have to tell other people. And then we have to remind each other. Read on in verse 28. Proclaiming him will involve warning. Now, warning has gone out of fashion. Warning is offensive and offense is the unforgivable sin in our culture. Heaven forbid that you give anyone offense. But if Jesus is at the center and you are living as though he's not, wouldn't you want someone to risk offending you so that they could warn you? If Jesus is the only way back to God and you missed it because warning is not polite in our culture, how would you feel? So in ministry, we, pro we proclaim Jesus and that means we warn people. When last did you warn someone? Out of love, not out of some sort of dry of pry self-righteousness, but out of love with tears in your eyes or in your heart. When last did you warn someone? Read on in verse 28. Proclaiming Jesus also means that we teach everyone with all wisdom. There it is again, that wisdom word. Now, this is not dry orthodox truth. This is the truth that Jesus is at the center, applied to every aspect of everyday life. We proclaim Jesus. That's the core business of the church. That's our method. Fifth mark of ministry is the goal. What's the goal of ministry? What are we hoping to achieve? Verse 28 again, him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why, Paul? What's the end? What's the end goal? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. The goal is maturity in Christ. Some translations say perfection. Neither word quite nails, nails it in the English. The goal is total undivided devotion to Christ. That's the goal of ministry. Conversion, as wonderful as that is, as much as we must pursue that, is not the goal. Devotion in every area of life is the goal. Now, maturity, it's hard to define, isn't it? But we know it when we see it. We know it when we see it. A mature Christian is a disciple who makes disciples. They are so devoted to Christ that you can see all the marks of ministry that we've just been talking about. You can see all of the marks of ministry all over them. They are servant-hearted. They are joyful in their service. They're not doing it to win the favor of men. They're doing it out of love for the Lord and for his people. Jesus is at the very center of their being. You can see it in the way they make difficult decisions, in the way they handle conflict or being insulted or being snubbed or being overlooked, in the way they handle real setbacks in life. You could just see Jesus right at the core of their being. The way they treat people of different standings in society. All of it so easily and obviously traceable back to Jesus at the center. And they proclaim him. 
They proclaim him. They want others to know this Jesus and to grow in their devotion to him. Nothing gets them more excited. Do you see it? I mean, I have faces in mind. Faces of people in our family, our church family. You know devotion to Jesus when you see it. You know them. You have faces in mind. You know them. You look up to them. That's what I'm talking about. That's the goal. That's where you're headed. That's maturity. That's, that's what God wants for your life. It's not necessarily, we obsess about what is God's plan for my life? Is it this career, this, you know, must I live in this neighborhood? What he wants for your life is maturity, undivided devotion to Christ. Sinclair Ferguson asks, how do we bring glory to God? He continues, the Bible's short answer is by growing more and more like Jesus Christ. If that's the goal, what's standing in the way? What are the obstacles? What areas of your life are competing with Jesus for your devotion? Is it your time, your me time? Is it maybe your work? Do you drop everything when the office calls? whether you really have to or not. Is it your children? They must have every opportunity in life. And then with whatever's left over, we'll give that to church. Is, is it your politics? Does it matter more to you that this person is a member of the EFF or the DA than that this person is a sister in Christ? Which matters more to you? When Paul is unpacking the goal of ministry for the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 1, this is what he says. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. Why, Paul? Why? What, what end do you have in mind when you struggle? That your hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Devotion to the King means that we are united in our love for him. It means that we would subvert all other claims to our allegiance. Everything else is secondary to our devotion to him. He wants total devotion, and when he has that, everything else will find its proper place. The goal of ministry is total devotion to Christ. If this sermon is feeling a bit like the Comrades Marathon, well, let me just give you an update. You are just hitting poly shorts, right? So on the uprun, poly shorts, you've only got eight, eight Ks or so to go. Now, what is eight Ks when you've already run more than 80? So hang in there. Hang in there. Gilbert Mukudwani can tell you all about it. Sixth mark of ministry. The means of ministry. Chapter 1, verse 29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul struggles, he labors, he toils, he suffers. But the energy to do it all is not his own. He is fueled by grace. You, you read about the life of Paul in Acts, you read his letters, you can see here is a man who is fueled by the grace of God. He is fueled by the fact that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done to save him and bless him. All he can do as Paul, no longer Saul, all he can do is work out of that reality. Paul doesn't labor towards God's favor. He labors from God's favor. Paul doesn't toil towards God's love. He toils from God's love. God loved him and favored him freely when he deserved exactly the opposite. And so now, secure in all of that love and favor, he can give himself totally to the Lord Jesus in ministry. See how it works? His work is fueled by the grace of God, not the other way around. His work is fueled by the grace of God. And so should ours be. If Jesus is at the center, if we're going to have any hope of glory, if we're going to have any joy in the face of suffering now, any chance of living as servants, then our ministry has to be fueled by grace. 
we have to cling to the truth that ministry is God's work from start to finish. And we just have the privilege, the joy of sharing in that work. Finally, can I have a hallelujah? Finally, the reason. The reason Paul reminds the Colossians, the reason God reminds us that this is the nature of ministry is there for us in chapter 2, verse 4. I say this. Why do you say it, Paul? I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. The reason the Colossians needed to be reminded of the true nature of ministry was that there were so many alternatives. There were so many supplements to proclaiming Jesus, to having him at the center, and, and they were so plausible. So many alternative models of ministry. There were and there still are. And they are so plausible, so attractive to us. Yes, gospel preaching is important. But shouldn't we be putting more time and energy into social development, given all the needs around us? Healing ministries work. Those churches are full. Could we be missing a trick? Shouldn't we invest just a little bit more in putting on, you know, in a, in a bit, more sh bit, bit, bit more of a show, a bit more energy, a bit more vibe, just to keep things current and connected? You see, it all sounds so very plausible. It sounds so attractive. And it's not that the, any of those things are bad. It's just that they're not the center. They're not the heartbeat of ministry. They are not what God considers of first importance. The marks of ministry are a call to servanthood, a cost in suffering, the method of proclaiming Jesus Christ, the goal of devotion, the means of grace, the danger of alternatives, and at the center of it all, the saving lordship of Jesus Christ. I'll leave you with this question from chapter 2 verse 5. Just have a look at chapter 2, verse 5. And let's ask this question of ourselves. If Paul was writing to Christ Church Midrand, would he rejoice over us in our ministry? The answer I come to is a great comfort and a great challenge at the same time. Let's pray. Father, please, we plea with you. Help us to keep Jesus at the center of all that we are and all that we do, all that we say, every thought. Transform us into joyful, sacrificial servants for the sake of others and for your glory. Bless our ministry, we pray. Amen. Folks, really good to work through this wonderful letter with you. And um, I hope that during the course of the week, you'll have an opportunity to read over this passage again, to meditate on it, to pray through it. And uh, let's all be praying that God would galvanize us in our local church ministry here at Christchurch Midrand. God be with you. Go well. Have an excellent week.